Welcome to this broadcast entitled Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. In recent weeks, during Louise's cause for beatification and its advancement, discussions are underway as to explain effectively the novelty of the gift of living in the divine will that brings with it a holiness of God's gratuitousness and a holiness of the virtues exemplified by the saints that preceded this gift. One tends to think that there is a opposition between the two, but there really isn't. And this is what is one of the obstacles that we are facing today in terms of reconciling or attempting to reconcile the two. That is, the holiness of the virtues exemplified by the saints before the outpouring of this gift of living in the divine will, and the holiness of God's gratuitous gift of living in the divine will. Otherwise put, there seems to be a misunderstanding on the part of the readers of Louise's writings who are impressed with the false idea that the holiness of the virtues is meaningless because now we have a new gift that supplants the virtues. And this is false. It's an unfounded theological argument. That requires, naturally, theological explanation. The only way, really, for Louisa cause, Louisa's cause to move forward at this point, in my opinion, is for theological explanations to intervene and explain effectively how her doctrines are consistent with not only 2,000 years of patristic and scholastic theology, but to explain theologically how the gift of living in the divine will does not do away with the importance or the exercise of the Christian virtues. And this false dichotomy, that is, the gift versus the virtues, unfortunately, was promoted for many decades. I'm sure those of you listening have come across the statement or the teaching or the notion that since the gift of living in the divine will is the greatest gift of all that surpasses even the gift of mystical marriage, those who receive this gift are no longer required to attain spiritual marriage or no longer required to exercise those virtues that led to spiritual marriage because the gift excels both the virtues and spiritual marriage. And this is a false teaching that needs to be addressed theologically to better understand the nature of the gift of living in the divine will within the context of church teaching and spiritual theology. So, perhaps one place to start, and there are many places to start to address this theological teaching, is the virtues. One of the places to begin is with the virtues. Now, in order to understand the nature of the gift of living in the divine will, one must understand perforce the nature of the Christian virtues, because we cannot receive the gift of living in the divine will without the exercise of the Christian virtues. Certainly, the gift surpasses the virtues. Even Thomas Aquinas teaches this. God's gifts surpass the virtues. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean that the virtues have no place anymore in the Christian life. And this is one of the assumptions that are taught and that are, that, um, are false. Thomas Aquinas teaches that the gifts are greater than the virtues. 
in as much as they are gratuitous infusions of God, whereas the virtues are acquired not by infusion nor immediately, but through repetition of good habits. Now, before I go into Aquinas' teachings, let me, let me start with the basics. Let us go back to the well, to the sanctity of the Christian virtues, which require particular attention, okay? Jesus tells Louisa, start with her writings in volume 22 on the Feast of the Assumption, 1927. It is my usual way to ask for small sacrifices, for the soul to deprive itself of a pleasure, of a desire, of a small interest, of some vanity, or to detach itself from something that seems to do it no harm. These small tests serve as little shelves upon which I place the great capital of my grace to dispose the soul to accept greater sacrifices. And when the soul is faithful to me in small tests, I then abound in grace and ask of it greater sacrifices so as to be able to enrich it even more and make it a portent of sanctity. How many sanctities begin with a small sacrifice? And how many, after denying me a small sacrifice, remain recalcitrant, emaciated in their good deeds, and weak in their journey along the path to heaven? So here the Lord is emphasizing the importance of small sacrifices that lead to greater, which lead to greater outpouring of grace and gifts. You see, the soul's progression in the virtues begins with God's grace through a small sacrifice. You see, when the soul offers up a small sacrifice, that is the virtue of mortification. Whether it's abstinence or fasting or self-denial, it's a virtue. And the soul's progression in the virtues begin with God's invitation to offer up a small sacrifice. This is a grace of God that inspires and disposes the soul to offer small sacrifices as pledges of its fidelity and love. Now, the more the soul remains faithful in its little sacrifices and small tests, the more God's grace increases within it to facilitate its exercise in virtue and augment its capacity for greater sacrifices and conquests. See, the soul's initial sacrifices require more attention than the greater sacrifices that follow. Because the small sacrifices dispose the soul for greater sacrifices, of which God avails himself to make of it a portent of sanctity. Now, analogous to the soul's progression in small tests and sacrifices is an athlete who finds the physical demands of a sport more rigorous in the initial than later weeks of training. Take, for example, exercise. If a soul is not adapted to fitness, when it exercises the first time, what happens? Lactic acid builds up in the muscle and it causes stiffness and pain. But that's necessary in order for the muscles to grow. The body, much like the soul, must accustom itself to an increasingly intensified regimen that maximizes its skills and actualizes its potential. And because the body is of an unconditioned athlete is more susceptible than a seasoned athlete to physical injuries, this unconditioned athlete must exercise more attention in its initial weeks of training. And the more the athlete trains, the more he maximizes his skills, and the less effort he exerts, and the easier becomes his task. Likewise, the soul, in the repetition of its acts and God's will, begins with small tests, small sacrifices, and greater attention. 
And in so doing, receives an increasing outpouring of grace that grants facility and loving joyousness to its exercise of the virtues. We find this in Louisa's volume 17 on September 18th, 1924. Now, Louisa acknowledges this truth when relating how the more the soul moves along the path of tests and trials, the easier becomes its exercise in virtue, as greater are the graces God bestows upon it. Take, for example, volume 6, May 15th, 1905, where Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, they say that the pathway to virtue is difficult. This is not true. It is difficult for one who does not set out to make its continuous flight in my will, because nothing, neither the grace, be sorry, because knowing neither the graces nor the consolations it may receive from God, and not having the agility to make its flight in my will, the virtues appear difficult. But for the soul who makes its flight, the pathway to virtue is extremely easy because my grace that inundates it fortifies it. The beauty of my virtues attracts it, and I, the divine spouse of souls, carry it as it cleaves to my arm and I accompany it along its journey. And the soul, instead of flee, feeling the weight of the virtues, the difficulty of making its flight in my will, seeks to hasten its flight in order to more quickly arrive at the end of its path and at its very center. Now, when Jesus tells Louisa that by the soul cleaving to his arms and always accompanying the Lord, Finding the virtues easy in their exercise, he does not mean that it's always easy. Rather, what the Lord is sharing here is that initially, as the soul grows in the virtues, there's the fatigue, there's the weight it feels of the exercise of the virtues. But as the soul progresses in the spiritual life, the exercise of the virtues become, as it were, a second nature to the soul, like breathing like walking, like talking. It doesn't have to exercise. These these come naturally. You know what? St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila say the same thing with regard to spiritual marriage. They talk about three, well, three stages, three levels of growth. John refers to these three stages as purification, where the exercise of the virtues are difficult. And the soul needs to be purged like gold in a fire. And it's painful. But the soul from pur purgation or purification advances to illumination. Now it begins to understand why God is leading the soul through this crucible of suffering. And through the exercise of the virtues which are, are ardu arduous from time to time. But then after illumination, the soul arrives at the point of unification with God's will where now the exercise of the virtues are like second nature to the soul. And the soul begins to long for suffering, long for sacrifice, because it sees through illumination the purpose of the suffering and sacrifice, the value of suffering and sacrifice. It sees that every suffering the soul endures is intrin intrin intrinsically linked, intimately connected, invariably bound, to the cross of Christ that saves souls and purifies them. And seeing that its sufferings help save souls from hell, increase the glory of the blessed in heaven and the angels in heaven and all of creation, it starts to want to do more, to save more souls through suffering. Now, Louisa acknowledges this truth. In her writings. She mentions that, as I shared in last week's segment on God's creative power, that this easy and joyful performance in the virtues of the soul derives from God's creative power, the power of God's divine will that operates in the soul that has 
faithfully through small tests, allowed his grace to detach it from earthly allurements, to render its virtues divine, and to consume its evil tendencies, and to remove its origin of evil and the seed of corruption. Now, this detachment of earthly allurements is absolutely essential for the virtues, for the exercise of the virtues to seem easy or appear easy. When a soul is detached, the virtues are very easy. When a soul is attached disordinately to earthly things, the virtues are very arduous to exercise. And the same applies analogously to an athlete. Take, for example, a person who is obese because of the vice of gluttony, trying to run a Boston Marathon, as opposed to a person who has trained him or her, his or her body after years of exercise and discipline running that marathon. To whom is that run easier? To the athlete that has trained and disciplined his or her body for years or to the obese person who has not ran one yard in 20 years? Well, why is this the case? One has disciplined and mortified the body, the other has not on a physical plane. Analogously, the same principle applies to the soul. Souls that are neophytes, not proficient in virtue, find the exercise of the virtues very difficult, and they ought to, because they have not sufficiently trained and mortified and disciplined the soul through small tests that lead to greater tests and sacrifices. So when Jesus speaks to Louisa of the soul exercising the virtues in the divine will in an extremely easy manner, this is what he's referring to, to a seasoned soul that has trained itself to detach itself. How? By the creative power of God. The soul cannot do it itself. The soul cooperates with God's power, but it's ultimately God's power that is detaching the soul from earthly allurements. And this is found in volume 2, May 23rd, 1899. And this detaching of itself from the inordinate um, trappings of the earth render the soul's virtues divine, consume its evil tendencies, remove its origin of evil. And this removing of its evil tendencies, which is found in volume 11, March 13th, 1912, does not mean that the soul is now immune from sin, is perfected in, the, um, in grace, confirmed in grace. Why? Because this confirmation and perfection in grace, in the absolute sense of the word, only happens with the beatific vision where the soul can no longer sin. So long as we are on earth, we can always sin. The Virgin Mary, though conceived without sin, could have sinned any moment of her life throughout her entire earthly existence until the moment she died and was assumed into heaven. Same thing with Louisa. Same thing with us. But the evil tendencies may be consumed in God's grace. See, cons consummation of the evil tendencies does not imply absolute imp impeccability on earth, which is what some may falsely assume, and which causes problems to this understanding of Louisa's doctrine and causes uh, problems to her cause going forward. Consummation of the evil tendencies means that the soul is grounded, stable, rooted, anchored in God's grace, so much so that it would prefer to die rather than commit one deliberate sin. Not that it cannot commit sin, which it can, but that it would prefer not to. That is what the consummation in evil tendencies means. And when Jesus speaks of the divine will's creative power removing from the soul its origin of evil, and the seed of corruption, which is found respectively in volumes 12, December 15, 1919, and volume 15, July 11, 1923, 
He's again not referring to this absolute state of impeccability on earth which does not exist, but rather to the soul's disposition to prefer to die rather than commit one deliberate sin. With this disposition, the soul is detached from this concupiscence which remains in it in its latent form, but not in its actual form. Certainly, concupiscence in its latency is always there in us, in its potency is always there in us. But if we don't consent to that, it is as good as dead, even though it's there within us. Sort of like a, a, a disease that's in remission. So when Louisa lived in the divine will, when Jesus said that, she had no more evil tendencies in her, that she was detached from earthly allurements, that the origin of evil was not present in her, that the seed of corruption was not there. He was not saying that she was living in a state of absolute impeccability, absolutely not. That would be heresy. Rather, he was saying that the seed was no longer in its active form present in her. It was now, while potent, or potent was not actual. The potential to sin was always present in Mary and Louisa, but they never acted on it, you see, after they received this gift. Louisa, Mary received it at conception, Louisa received it at the age of 24. They could have sinned, but they chose not to. So within Louisa was the seed of corruption, this origin of evil, but never in Mary, who was conceived without sin. But Louisa, after receiving the gift of living in the divine will, never engaged in this tendency of evil, in the seed of, never actualized the seed of corruption or this origin of evil. Without God's creative power that renders the soul's virtues divine, the virtues are not acquired without hardship and fatigue. And they can neither be exercised, as Jesus tells Louisa, in all circumstances and in every place, nor continuously. So we're talking about two things here. One, the creative power of God's divine will puts into remission, so to speak, all the evil tendencies, the origin of evil and the seed of corruption and the attachment to earthly allurements that we are born with. It doesn't destroy them. It puts them into remission, perpetual state of remission. Only the beatific vision definitively destroys these. So if in the soul in purgatory has to be purified of this origin of evil, the seed of corruption, this evil tendency, this attachment to earthly allurements. Even in purgatory, they're not completely destroyed, only with a beatific vision. They are progressively destroyed in purgatory. That's the purpose of purgatory. Through God's creative power that, that purges and destroys them, which is a painful process. But it is God's creative power that renders the soul's virtues divine, whether it's in purgatory or on earth, for the souls who live in his divine will. Now, that's the first part that I wish to share with you. The second part is that these, the creative power of God makes the Christian virtues divine virtues. And what are these divine virtues? Aquinas calls them angelic virtues. These divine virtues can be exercised in all circumstances and in every place, even when a person is sleeping. Why? How is it possible? If the Christian virtues can only be exercised through the deliberate, conscientious exercise of the intellect, memory, and will, how can the soul while asleep engage in these virtues? Because they are not only Christian, but they are now divine meaning God's creative power operates within us even when we are sleeping. This is the fruit of the gift of living in the divine will that the saints did not experience before Louisa. The saints exercised the Christian virtues. Now God is restoring to us, 
in addition to the Christian virtues, which we've never lost, but he's, he's, he's adding to the Christian virtues a greater quality. The virtues that Adam and Eve exercised in Eden, the divine or angelic virtues, that now may be exercised in all circumstances and in every place, and continuously provided the soul is in the state of grace and living in God's divine will. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 11 on September 25th, 1913, my daughter, I had to actualize sanctity in such a way that it might be easy and accessible to all, in all conditions, in all circumstances, and in every place, unless, of course, the soul does not want it. And he also tells her the same thing in volume 28 on July 4th, 1930. Now, many of us desire this gift with all our life, heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, as we ought to. But some of us tend to de-emphasize the importance of the Christian virtues. Now, Jesus had to, even to Louisa, remind her of the importance of exercising the Christian virtues. For example, when he tells her, to fuse herself, not just in the divine will, but in the order of grace. And this is an important teaching as well, because it reminds us of the importance of the Christian virtues. So I'm going to share this passage with you. I'm going to pull it up here. This comes from... um, Volume 17, May 17th, 1925. My daughter, to all you have said concerning the fusing of yourself in my will, another application must be added, that of fusing yourself in the order of grace. Now, why did Jesus tell Louisa that in addition to fusing herself in his will, she must not forget to fuse herself in the order of grace? Because there can be no gift of living in the divine will without the exercise of the Christian virtues in the order of grace. Let me remind you of what St. Hannibal wrote to Louisa in a letter. And I believe this letter was from uh, August 30th, 1926. Now, in this letter, I'll share it with you in Italian, just the part of it where St. Hannibal refers to himself as her spiritual director. Small s, small d. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, is her also her spiritual director, but capital S, capital D. So St. Hannibal tells Louisa, Io però sempre insisto sopra un punto, cioè la santità non consiste in una formula. Here he's telling her, I, however, must always insist on this point. That is, that holiness does not consist in a formula. And then he adds, Perché si formino con questa nuova scienza santi che superino quelli passati? Bisogna che i nuovi santi abbiano pure tutte le virtù in grado eroico dei santi antichi, dei confessori, dei penitenti, dei martiri, dei fiancoriti, dei vergini, etc. Here he's telling, and I'll translate this to you, in order to form with this new knowledge of living in the divine will saints who may surpass those of the past, the new saints must also have all the virtues and in heroic degree of ancient saints, of the confessors, penitents, martyrs, anchorites, virgins, etc. Let me repeat that to you. St. Hannibal's telling Louisa, I, however, must insist on this point, that sanctity does not consist of a formula. In order to form the new knowledge of living in the divine will, saints, who may surpass those of the past, the new saints who live in God's will must also have all the virtues of the saints of the past, and in heroic degree. You see? 
Now, to further emphasize this truth that Hannibal teaches, some people may be thinking, well, that's Hannibal's opinion. Maybe he was wrong. Well, he wasn't wrong. Not only is he a saint, but his words are confirmed by Jesus Christ. And um, I'm going to pull that passage up for you as well, where Jesus corroborates in different words the same teaching that Hannibal just shared with Louisa. Jesus tells Louisa, that where all other sanctities end, living in the divine will begins. He tells her this in volume 16, November 8th, 1923. I chose to centralize in you, Louisa, all the interior states which have been until now on the path of holiness. In this way, as you observe the ascetic practices of these interior states before the gift was given, while doing your acts in my will, I bring about their completion. I crown them and embellish them, thereby sealing them with my own seal. Everything must achieve completion in my will. And where other sanctities end, the sanctity of my will of such noble and divine qualities has its beginning and keeps all other sanctities at its footstool. So allow me to act, allow me to repeat my life and what I accomplished with so much love in the work of redemption, which I now wish to repeat in you with greater love to establish in you the beginning of the gift of living in my will so that its laws may be known. Now, what I wish to emphasize here is the beginning of this passage of November 8th, 1923. I chose to centralize in you, Louisa, all the interior states. Now, what is he saying here? Louisa had to not only exercise the Christian virtues like the saints before her, but attain the states of intimate union that they attained, including spiritual betrothal, spiritual marriage, in order to receive the gift of living in the divine will. So he tells her, I chose to centralize in you all the interior states which have up until now been on the path of holiness. In this way, you, Louisa, observe the ascetic practices of these interior states while doing acts in my will, and I bring about their completion. I crown them and embellish them. So here the Lord saying that Louisa experienced spiritual marriage, spiritual betrothal, or first spiritual betrothal, spiritual marriage, then the gift of living in the divine will, in that order. And therefore she practiced all the ascetic practices that accompanied them. That means all the heroics, like Hannibal said, and in heroic degree. Okay, now here's the question for you. You're probably thinking, Oh my goodness, there's no hope for me. If I have to be like John of the Cross, like Teresa of Avila, like Catherine of Siena, like Francis de Sales, like Bernard of Clairvaux, like all these famous spiritual doctors, and I have to attain mystical marriage before I receive the gift, then I will never receive the gift of living in the divine will. But see, that's not the case. There's a difference between Living in the divine will completely, which Louisa did, and living in the divine will imperfectly, which we can do immediately. Louisa had to interiorize, Jesus tells her, because she was the second daughter after Mary, who will always be the big daughter. Louisa will always be the little daughter to receive the gift of living in the divine will, but the first creature conceived in sin to do so, she had to perforce interiorize through the work of God in her, the power of God, all the previous interior states of mystical union with God. We don't have to do that because we are not the second daughter. She does. She has to form the perfect kingdom within herself in order to be that third link in this triple chain formed by the link of Jesus, Mary, and Louisa, to administer this gift to us. So why don't we have to where Louisa does? Why don't we have to interiorize all these 
states of spiritual betrothal, marriage, in order to live in the divine will, like Louisa did. Because, again, there's a difference between uh, living in the divine will imperfectly, perfectly, and completely. These are three different levels. Louisa was called to live in it completely. And she got there not at the age of 24. She got there at the age of 35 on November 16, 1900. That's when she attained the complete union with the divine will. It took her 11 years to get there from the moment she received the gift at the age of 24 to the age of 25, 35. So you see, she received the gift, but she was not yet completely living in it for 11 years. Likewise, we can receive the gift and not live completely in it. Let me further emphasize or articulate this point from taken from volume 11 that I shared with you on different occasions. Um, Jesus gives Louisa an image of an ocean, a sea. And she doesn't say what these objects are that she sees in the, in, the, in the sea. But she articulates the following passage. I want to give you the date before I share this with you. It's taken from June 29th, 1914, volume 11. She writes, my ever beloved Jesus came and said to me, my beloved daughter, did you see that? The sea symbolizes my immensity. While the objects, not, I have a little bit of a glitch here in this. I have to refresh it. Yep. To close this program and reopen up. Sometimes there are glitches on my laptop, unfortunately. But he tells her in volume 11, while I'm pulling it up again, that what well, the objects that she saw on the, on the um, ocean symbolize the souls who live in his will, but with different ways of living. He tells her, some live in my will on the surface, others beneath the surface, and yet others completely lose themselves in me, all varying according to how they live in my will. Some souls live in my will in an imperfect way, others in a more perfect way, and yet others reach the point of completely losing themselves in my will. So you see here, Louisa did not reach the point of completely losing herself in his will until the age of 35, but yet she received the gift, and therefore the ability to impact all creatures with every breath, and exercise the virtues continuously in every circumstances and place, yet while sleeping, even before living completely in his will. So we can receive the gift of living in the divine will immediately, provided we are in the state of grace and desire it with an upright intention and a firm desire. There are no formulas to receive the gift, as Hannibal said. But we must exercise the Christian virtues like the saints in the past did. And the more we offer up small tests, small sacrifices, and exercise the virtues in small manners, the more God increases these virtues through his grace within us and the more he disposes us to greater conquests. So we progress from an imperfect manner of living in God's will to a more perfect manner through the exercise of the Christian virtues that in time God divinizes within us, whereby they become divine virtues. And the more these, these Christian virtues become divine, the more impact we exercise over all creation, the more light we shed throughout creation, embellishing creation, increasing the accidental glory of all creation. So we must bear in mind that living in the divine will does not do away with the Christian virtues. On the contrary, it perfects them, it embellishes them. As, we just, as I just shared with you in that passage taken from Louisa, dictated by Jesus, that I will reiterate again in part just to remind you of the importance of the, of the complementarity of the Christian virtues and the gift of living in the divine will. Jesus again tells Louisa, 
as you observe the ascetic practices of these interior states that preceded you, while doing your acts in my will, I bring about their completion. I crown them, I embellish them, sealing them with my own seal. Here the Lord is saying that I'm not doing away with the Christian virtues or spiritual marriage or spiritual betrothal that you experienced before. I'm rather embellishing them, crowning them, sealing them. Why? Because everything must achieve completion in God's will. God does not burn any bridges. The gift of living in the divine will does no more away with the Christian virtues of the saints exercised before Louisa than the New Testament does away with the Old Testament. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to perfect it. And the same principle applies to the gift of living in the divine will. So yes, the Christian virtue exercise becomes extremely easy for those who become proficient in the exercise of the virtues and, the, and who live in God's divine will. Now the virtues are not exercised, let's say, as stage one. And then God gives us his gift as stage two in a linear fashion. That's not how this works. Rather, they are interwoven. They are contemporaneous in their exercise and reception. That is, the Christian virtues exercise and the reception of the gift of living in the divine will. They are contemporaneous. So we can, in the state of grace, desire God's will with a firm desire and upright intention and receive it immediately, even in an imperfect manner of living, whereby our thoughts, words, and actions impact all things that of all time immediately. And we can exercise the virtues continuously, even in an imperfect manner. But as we grow through the exercise of the Christian virtues under the action of the Holy Spirit and God's creative power, as we continue to frequent the sacraments, as we pray steadfastly every day, God increases these Christian virtues within us whereby they become divine virtues. They become exercised in an unheroic manner. And as God's increasing these exercises of the Christian virtues, making them advance from just Christian to divine virtues, God is also increasing within us the life of his will, expanding our souls and the kingdom of his will within our will that contain the acts of all creatures. So as we continue to exercise the Christian virtues, we're doing our rounds in creation. We're doing our prevenient act. We're meditating on the hours of the passion. We're doing the actual acts. And we're not neglecting the Christian virtues. On the contrary, God is embellishing them within us. He's perfecting them, sealing them with his own will, thereby rendering them divine. To the point in which we advance from an imperfect manner of living in his will to a perfect manner to finally a complete manner. And it is to these people who are living in his will in a complete ma manner that the exercise of the virtues are extremely easy, you see. They're not easy for the people that just begin this path. They are easy for the proficients, which Louisa was. And God is calling us all to live in this complete stage of his will. He wants no one to be excluded. All my brothers and sisters in Christ, continue to support Radio Maria in your prayers and monetary offerings. And as you do, and as we move forward in these end times, May God continue to protect you, administer to you his grace, and always keep you alive in his will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.